afternoon, everyone. What a joy and delight to be together with you on this amazing day in Boston in any event. It's sunny, humid. People are thronging on Newbury Street and many come to the gallery to see the exhibitions presently here, that of Enrico Pinardi and the works of Hideaki Miyamura, which we're going to spend a good deal of time talking about with you, sharing it with Hide and with Franz Nikolai, who is at least an old friend and a dear friend um, through many exhibitions that he presented um, at the Holderness School um, as a way of building understanding for fine art ceramics. So we ask him to join us in sharing responses to and questions with Hide today about his work. The title of the conversation is Ever Risky. Um, part of that comes from uh, his own adventure and part of it comes from my training and introduction to ceramics for Brother Thomas whose uh, phrase, risking and dreaming are primary acts of creativity. And that notion informs my life, I think also the life of the gallery um, in so many ways. The opportunity to be open, to dream, and at the same time, dreaming, if you're going to execute on some of those dreams, involves risk. Certainly ceramics and high-fired ceramics um, are at the top of that list in terms of a tightrope walking with the fire and the control or lack thereof and the openness to what one has created. So Hidi, I just wanted to um, see and ask you about a number of things today. First and foremost, um, maybe 12 years ago, I visited the Sir Percival David collection of Chinese ceramics in London. At that time, it was housed um, in the, uh, the University of London in an old house. And now it is presented in the British Museum in an absolutely gorgeous gallery. Mm. And it's called Imperial Tradition. And that was when I began to understand that certainly within Japanese tradition, there's the Yonobi, the function and form. And then there's the other tradition of Imperial. Imperial, at least as I understood it, had to do with works of beauty that inform life. And they don't necessarily, particularly the piece behind you, is a little tough to get a flower in and out of, let alone a bouquet. <laughs> but it does speak of beauty mm. in such an extraordinary way that it could inform all of our lives. And I just wanted your sort of response to the notion of the way you approach your work is your intention to create works of beauty or of use. And use in this case could also mean a spiritual, uh, non-material use. Mm. Just what you needed was that as the first question, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, I always um, thinking about uh, shape, shapes and the glazes. And um, I started to testing glaze almost, I don't know, 25 years ago. I was an apprentice in Japan and for six years and my, my assignment was creating new glazes. So every day I tested 30, 40 test pieces. And uh, that is my assignment in the morning. In the afternoon, throwing it's a lot of pieces, same things over and over again, it's one year. And the second year, a little bit bigger uh, shape. So um, after six years, I learned so many things, so many uh, glazes and, uh, glazes and uh, shapes. But uh, my idea shape is beauty of shapes and not the Japanese style shapes. I like more European, Scandinavian, uh, like a, more like a skinny necks and a small uh, bottom, you know, like a foot. That's the, uh, my beauty to the shape. And um, I talked to France about uh, the, I was so influenced by, uh, we were talking about yesterday, uh, uh, Italian glass blowers work. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I came here, this country, I was so into glass. But before I started study, I was, I was very interested to be a glass blower. But, you know, the, not the great glass blower in Japan at that time. So I um, switched to the, uh, you know, ceramics. So after this, I got this country, and uh, there's so many nice Italian and uh, 
uh, European glass blowers work, so many of them. So I was so into the shape of glass. So same time I was studying, testing many, many uh, glazes, but didn't come out well. So that was almost 20 years ago. And uh, then gradually uh, glaze, those very, I'm always looking for rare glazes, so came out. So then I, I, I thought, how about the combine between nice modern shapes and uh, my rare glazes combined? So what's gonna happen? So I, I just uh, away from the uh, production work. So first three years, I think that when I get this country, I, I, just, I did the production work. Uh, every day, cups, mugs, those, I, I made those things, but I'm getting tired of it. So they switched to the uh, more like a warmer kind of piece, you know, therefore that I changed my mind that I, and moving so in that direction. And so yeah. Franz, would you respond to the set of questions around the search for beauty, form, and glaze? And Rose, if we can look at the, one of the pieces that we're going to be looking at, that may, may be nice too. Yes, I think in, in Idiaki's work, um, the form is what hits you first, even though I think in his own mind, the, the glaze is the is the beautiful embellishment and the form is the way to present or deliver the uh, the beauty of the, of the glaze. But yes, and when I look at uh, Hideaki's work in a in a in a as a whole, um, it talks about um, a sense of quiet presence, yet in that quietude of boldness uh, and. Uh, in in the sheer confidence of the form itself, I guess you might say, uh, there's no hesitation anywhere in the in the in the um, the convex and concave transitions. Uh, there's a surety about it, but a quiet uh, quiet surety that I think is just uh, is powerful in its proportions, and the way um, we'll see a difference. In, in his work at some of the pieces like the one that is behind this one here uh, and the one behind it where it starts from a very small base and then fills. Uh, when I look at ceramics, I often look at it in anthropomorphic terms. And even when we describe uh, among potters uh, pieces, we talk about the foot, the belly, the shoulder, the neck, the lip. Um, we, we ascribe human characteristics to it. And, um, and his work embodies the grace that we see in the human form, as well as in all of nature around us. And, and for me, the, um, it's a nice dance. It's like a slow dance between form and application of glaze, uh, where one isn't overpowering the other. Um, so that there's a there's a an elegance uh, to the to that combination together in most of Hideaki's pieces, and in fact, in the newer work that we'll see later with the the Luna glaze, um, he challenges that notion and is playing around with uh, a more of a, a tension between surface and form that we can talk about later. But I find it very interesting, mm -hmm. and that that interest and that challenge comes whenever you're trying new work and uh, applying it and that that kind of um, exploration that that uh, that depends on imperfection um, in, a, in a way that uh, works towards resolution. The issues of balance and form that you're raising of slender and belly and foot are all part of a beautiful work of art under the best of circumstances. But my sense is in addition that the ceramics that I have most interest in um, always share the spirit of the maker. So right. it is um, the notion in actually in Jewish tradition of neshama, which is the word for soul, but it's also the word for breath or spirit. And so I look at a work like the one on the screen now and feel very much that it infuses my life with spirit, energy, and joy. And that has to have come from the maker. 
It's not only what I bring to it. So the sense that we can in a, be inspired by an object just made of clay with some chemicals on it is a miracle in and of itself. And the joy mm. of having his work in the gallery is exactly that miracle. Rose, can we look at the next piece? And he did, if you talk about this particular yeah. piece, both in glaze, also yeah. uh, in form, um, for people who are looking at it, that handle actually works mm. and the lid comes off that's sure. sunken in in this beautiful scallop yeah. uh, top. Mm. Well, this uh, piece, um, I use the uh, blue hair spa glaze. Uh, that's my, uh, my, I spent a long time to develop and uh, I combined uh, two glazes. So um, after I apply uh, the blue hair spa, then I apply the, uh, the, the, you can see the brown bundle, uh, the glaze. So to make second glaze, which is brown glaze, took me, I don't know, like a, I tested over 50 to 80 test pieces. Particularly this glaze, second one, it's a just right fit for the uh, uh, blue hair spur. Uh, when you see the detail, it's just glaze is dancing, you know, moving. Just that's I like. Uh, my idea is glazes have to be, glaze have to be, uh, have to have depth on it and some kind of motion on it, movement on it. That uh, grace, I, I really like, liked it very, very much. So I always try to uh, make, you know, those uh, movement uh, on it and uh, balance on it. That's I like. This is the, uh, really, I like the combination two glazes. And when you look at the, the line, uh, kind of wavy, uh, lines. Then same thing. I made carved wavy line on top. So it's just a whole uh, not only movement of glaze, but also the uh, uh, the top beam. That's the uh, wavy shape that I express uh, the movement of wave. You know, ocean wave. Those things. So that's, yeah, I express this piece for this piece. Franz, your thoughts about it? Yeah, I'm specifically attracted to the, uh, well, the form as a showcase uh, to the glaze uh, as we, with the last piece where it started small and filled up like your, like an inhale, it just has a full of energy. In this case, it, the widest um, uh, diameter is near the the connection to the to the earth and it's much more solid so it's just acts as a a presence or a showcase wow. for the glaze and when i look at that glaze i see two uh a reference to two natural events uh one is the, uh, i i see often up here in new hampshire and surrounded by the forest this uh, at a rainstorm how everything is really sharp and the raindrops cling to surfaces in the beginning, and then as more rain accumulates, it it has that feeling of movement and and bleeds down. I mm -hmm. see that, and then when Hideaki mentioned the uh, the wave um, the wave um, image, I see that too at the sort of the way the waves come into a beach and then recede back. I, I, the, the clarity of the waves coming to the beach and then that slow pull back into the ocean beneath it. I, I see a reference in this piece to uh, those natural events. There's also this wonderful sense of scale. This is 20 and a half inches high, which is really a very um, major piece in the show, I think. And also the fact that before you fire it, it probably is 20 or 25% yeah, yeah. even larger. Mm -hmm. So the control of the porcelain to create this shape, then what you're talking about in terms of the undulation, especially with the lip, and then the pleasure of lifting the top off and just feeling that in your hand. And if the top is off, it's a totally different piece. The top acts in many ways almost like a hat on a person mm. where the hat transforms it. But even without the top, it has this wonderful elegance to it and at the same time, elegance informed by solidity, meaning that you know this is a solid form. 
it's independable beauty uh, that we're looking at with this piece, which is really quite, quite remarkable. And he did the uh, photographer who you've worked with uh, has done an absolutely beautiful job of photographing the pieces because porcelain and the shiny surfaces are almost impossible to get without cat's eyes. And these are just beautiful, beautiful photographs of the pieces themselves. So let's look at something very different in Hide's vocabulary. There you go. Um, and Franz, why don't you respond to this first, and then Hide can talk a bit about how he got to this, and especially with the pagoda top. Well, the, uh, oh, Franz? Yes. Um, Hide K has both this blue, um, lovely blue celadon and white uh, celadon crackle glazes in his repertoire. And for me, it's um, it's just, as I was saying before, that that very elegant and quiet yet distinct uh, combination of uh, form and surface decoration. Um, um, not only that, you I'm drawn to the crackle glaze and pattern first and foremost, how the how the black lines break up the uh, the big round under, um, formal shape as a as a nice counterpoint one to the other the large bulbous form with the detail networking almost like a map if you will if you're looking at a map of a city that's been transposed onto a form it's busy in its in its uh, particular um, patterning but yet it's softened and married uh, completely with the with the quietude of the of the form itself, and then you have that nice accent, if you will, um, with uh, the shape of the lid its, itself. I think that's a really spectacular part of it, uh, because you have that the the largeness and the fullness of the volume, and then you have the detailing and of the scribing around the, the lid itself as an accent. One defines the other. The, the detail of the lid helps describe or count, offer a counterpoint to the fullness of the form and vice versa. I think it's a beautiful piece. It's beautifully said. So Hide, now you're in trouble. Now you have to just talk about the piece. Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, the, uh, everybody knows about the, uh, uh, who made uh, Saladon Grace. Of course, you know, Chinese uh, people made it long time ago. And uh, they say uh, best color of Seldon is the color of after the rain in the summertime. So I don't know this expression, it's you know, right to my glaze. I try to make a blue, you know, sky, sky, sky light, uh, sky, you know, sky color. So I, I think it's very close to the uh, blue sky, this color. So I really uh, satisfy this. Uh, you know, grace. And um, I try to, same thing, I try to make movement or design on the surface all the time on the grace. So uh, simple crackle grace is, the, you know, the pieces crack, you know, grace crack evenly. So you can see all even cracks, but I try to make a design on it. So you can see part of portion, you can see a spiral design. That's the, uh, my idea. That's the uh, different kind of design on, you know, color plus design on the surface. That's my idea. So on the lid, uh, the idea from uh, temple, from, you know, the, you can see all everywhere in Japan, the five layer of, you know, uh, roof, you know, temple. So idea came from that. So that's the, uh, uh, that's my kind of favorite piece. I made so far. Talk just a bit about how you uh, create the uh, patterns. Patterns, oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I always like to uh, test anything clay to a glaze. So I found I, uh, the clay formula. And uh, then I found, tested the glaze formula. So just to, materials just right fit to make this uh, design. So it's very interesting. Uh, so that's, you know, I'm just sometimes I get crazy, you know, just doing 
something over and over again uh, to get the tilt, to get the just right, you know, uh, design, right, right piece. So uh, this is a clay body and uh, uh, glaze, just right shrinkage to make this spiral design. Fabulous. One of the things that always strikes me about artists who uh, wait for the muse to tap on their shoulder before they get inspired to work as contrasted with artists who understand that the work itself only comes out of working. Mm -hmm. um, and what you have done is to continue to invest in yourself and your work mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis. And out of that process, all of these discoveries, if that's what they are, mm -hmm. all of these revelations, all of these moments of aha, it worked finally, um, is the result of just plain work. And people mm -hmm. should understand that um, waiting for the muse to come along is a very nice romantic version of how art is made. But I would say that virtually every artist that we work with in the gallery works every day. And it's only out of the work that the work is born. Mm -hmm. The next piece, in fact, the next two pieces, but let's just look at one of them, I think is again, absolutely extraordinary, uh, both in shape and glaze, um, in the moment of absolute beauty mm -hmm. uh, that you have created with this. And it is a slightly uh, cantilevered square form. It isn't an absolute square. Um, so talk about it, Hide, in the sense of you're sure. having either mm -hmm. built this, yeah. you obviously through the top, yeah. um, and how it came into being. And the foot's very beautiful on this. Oh, well. th this, uh, to make this shape, I, I don't know how many I lost. Uh, because the, uh, I started from uh, slabs, you know, slab, slab uh, construction. So after fire, because I grew up really high temperature, it's all shrink is so high, almost, you know, those clay shrink 20%. And uh, the corner, it's always cut, always separate. And over and over again, I just, I, I almost give up. Then I, um, how about the mold technique? So I used the, um, I decided to use mold on the middle section. So I throw on the bottom and I use mold on the, uh, the middle section and the top I throw uh, the, the piece. So, but difficulty is still the centering. You have to get the just right center to make a top portion. Otherwise, the top portions go right and, you know, the left and the just, yeah. it's not, uh, not, you know, not great things to, to uh, uh, to develop, so I was struggling, and then uh, after I made the middle portion, I uh, the corner of top, I just used the uh, hand build just a little. Then I throw uh, like a cylinder shape. Then attached to the uh, corner. Uh, then I started throw on the top. Then made a finish. I uh, finish. Uh, finished the top portion, but uh, technically, this one is quite difficult. Probably, I don't know how many people can do this. Uh, this drawing, you know, uh, three pieces attached together, then still have to be centered. So uh, that's technically this piece is very, very uh, difficult. Do so, you want to talk a bit not about how it was made, but how it feels? Yes, definitely. And that's interesting he hearing Hideki talk about the construction because oftentimes in great works of art that uh, present themselves uh, in, a, in a simple, elegant uh, form belie all the, right. all the work that goes into it. And, right. and that's the purpose of it in a, in a similar way when you mat a, a, a photograph, for example, mm -hmm. the mat is there to bring attention and focus to the main event, which is the image itself. And so uh, I appreciate all of the experimentation that Hideaka, Hideaka does uh, going into it. But when I see it, it, it uh, for me, feels like, um, again, this is the anthropomorphism uh, kind of working into play, but I see it as a sentinel. You know, a large uh, a piece that's very uh, 
centered in itself and very sure of itself and it gives that sense of, of presence that many of Hideki's work do. And it's that quiet president, uh, presence. And, and Bernie, you spoke earlier that the pots also describe the person. And as I get to know Hideki more, there's a, a, there's a real centered and balanced uh, present presence that, that Hideki offers the world, both in his being as well as in the pieces that he presents. And then to have that embellished with the uh, this beautiful gold glaze that he's developed. Sometimes it's it's um, got lots of uh, minute reflections throughout it. Sometimes it has kind of a soft scale look, even though it's very smooth. And then have that uh, transition into the darker uh, piece on the bottom as it you know as it as it lightly cloaks it or covers it in a very uh, quiet and subtle way. It maintains the strength of the presence of the vertical form, uh, yet it has the delicacy uh, as well that it presents. I think it's a, a fabulous piece. Beautifully said. I'm just wondering if you think, as you describe the piece as he did, if you think he's a square. No. <laughs> yeah, someone told me that. <laughs> I'd say there's, Are you there's, square? there's strength you know, in verticality, most, most people, and that's what it shows. <laughs> most of people said, you know, once people getting older, pe people getting milder and round, but you're getting square and the square, <laughs> getting old and square. <laughs> yeah, right. I love, he squared up on all four sides. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love the exchange between the two of you and also the piece itself, because there is a sense of both grace and strength in this particular piece for me. The elegance, clearly, of, of the neck and the mm. lip of it the foot and the balance between the uh, neck and the footing of it at the same time. And then the very gentle uh, upward movement of the piece visually uh, in the presence. It just has a, a very, very beautiful presence um, in and of itself. And then the side texture that uh, takes place on each of the four sides literally uh, replaces for me the need for a Frankenthaler. So let's look at the next piece, please. I don't know what to say because in a sense it's taken the last two or three pieces without the crackle glaze piece in the middle um, and brought it to another form that is very reminiscent of the um, bronze Chinese bells mm -hmm. uh, in a wonderful way with the, both the strength and the elegance again. But that's not my job, it's yours, Hide, to talk about. Yeah, uh, this is the, uh, uh, this gold glaze is the newest one. Uh, the, uh, I developed almost five, four or five years ago. That was kind of the uh, the original original gold glaze was kind of the uh, uh, like a copper tone, like a more like a dark, you know, looks like a copper. And then I changed the formula over and over again that they were more like a gold crystalline crystal glaze. So you can see the bottom those you can see really nice crystals there. So that was very very interesting that. I am uh, using loading kiln. Uh, that's so interesting that one kind of inspiration hit my head and uh, use this chemical. And then I, you know, in my, in my, in my head. So I, I started to use the chemical and uh, I find it, it came out really bright gold. So that's the, uh, that was great. I don't know why it's happened, but the, uh, uh, that was very interesting uh, uh, things happened to me. And since then I used that, used this glaze and uh, uh, quite, I, 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 I like this glaze very much. Um, the shape, same way, just I wanted to make some movement on top. So rim the same way I make a wavy shape there. And uh, I always like uh, leaded shape. So put the lid on that and just uh, looks like a bell to me, bell shape. So uh, that's, that's the, uh, I created a uh, bell shape with uh, gold, gold glaze. Can you talk just a little bit about the almost carved textured surface near the top? Yeah. 
um, the um, the color of the glaze uh, because the uh, top uh, portion is kind of the clay is very thin, so uh, the clay is at the high temperature glaze doesn't hold, so it start to run, so it's getting thinner, uh, glaze getting thinner, then change the uh, doesn't make any crystal crystal anymore, crystallize anymore, so those thick glaze run down. Uh, middle to bottom, uh, then make more uh, like a small star like uh, shape uh, crystal there. So that's, I think it's very interesting uh, the piece to me. Well, it's nice of you to say so. Franz, what do you think? I have to say, this was one of my favorite pieces in the current show at your gallery. Um, I, I absolutely adore this piece because of its subtlety and its power combined. The, I love the way the uh, form is a slight uh, cone shape, but not drawing its attention to the fact that it's a slight cone. And then it's complemented by an inversion of that cone as the handle for the, for the lid. So you've got the, the structure itself is inward and at the top, the handle is going slightly outward and it's a nice um, echoing of that form in a very subtle way. But when I first saw this piece, what I saw was the undulating uh, form uh, uh, edge at the top of the form, which gives a very, the very solid form a delicacy to it with that, that slow moving undulating line around the edge. It, and, um, again, that's a nice, complement uh, where one defines the other the that moving edge that creates movement complements the the straightforwardness of the formal form and as well as the um, as the inverted cone and the cone shape itself uh, kind of echoing and and defining each other I, I think it's perfectly balanced in that way it has all that that we've spoken about before, which is a sense of a presence of elegance and of strength um, in the piece. And then the handle itself, rather than giving into the um, pagoda type with the circles on it, uh, is simplified and brings your eye back down into the piece um, in really quite an extraordinary, extraordinary way. And then we move on to another of the most recent um, glazes, uh, Hide, you need to talk about it and talk yep. us through how you got here. Okay. The uh, um, lunar glaze uh, is just, I think, um, probably in, uh, many people, many potter use this glaze, I think. Uh, it's not the rare glaze. And uh, uh, a few, last year, I'm thinking about uh, this glaze and uh, uh, because a long time ago, when I started to do uh, Johan Temoku glaze, which is a, I, it's the same 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 thing that I call the uh, Johan Temoku uh, Temoku glaze and uh, blue hairs. So it's all same same glaze, same formula. It's, uh, so uh, when I tasted uh, Johan Temoku a long time ago, uh, it's always make bubble everywhere. So that was almost uh, uh, 20, 25 years ago. I, uh, I like to use that the stoneware at that time because the uh, traditionally Japanese people like like uh, to 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 use the uh, stoneware, like especially uh, tea ceremony. People always like stoneware instead of the uh, porcelainware. So that's the reason why the uh, or pinhole, the, like uh, the crater everywhere. Uh, on my temple glaze, but it's so sharp. You know, you can you cannot touch it because you can you can cut your finger because it's so sharp. So then um, I was thinking I want to try one more time. Then uh, this glaze came out. Okay, so this is the uh, similar, but the uh, uh, edge is so uh, not sharp at all, and um, looks like a moon crater crater. So, um, oh, this is great. When you look at it, the original glaze, it's nothing exciting. So 
then um, I had the gold, you know, uh, uh, magic marker. So I started paint hole each hole on my test piece. And the result was quite nice. I like it. So then, then um, I made uh, three, three pieces, I think. This is one of them. Uh, how about uh, using 24 karat gold, last hour? So I painted it was 24, you know, last away each hole. Then I had to fire one more time. So I fired it. It's uh, the, the, you know, the piece just came out really nicely. I, I, I really like this, you know, uh, piece and the other crater blades with gold, gold last away. So that's the, uh, that's my, uh, you know, history of my creating this glaze. And the idea that using gold last a while. He goes back to that phrase, risking and dreaming are primary acts of creativity. And with that would probably go the notion of just simply having to work. That out of the work itself grows the work itself. And then your openness to what you've created at a certain point saying, aha, I like that. Mm. Let me share that with others. And Franz, your thoughts about that glaze and how you yes. respond to it? Um, Again, what, one thing that I uh, love about seeing this, if we can bring it up on the screen again, I, um, it, what I love about it is that we're invited with this piece to, to see uh, Hideaki's exploration. Um, the other pieces in the show are much more refined in a traditional sense, both in form and, and uh, glazed surface. And this takes a departure, uh, as far as I can tell, although Hideaki, you may want to explain later where it came from in your history and where you see it going, because that was an interesting story too. But for me, uh, what this piece does is it invites us to, to be part of the exploration with, uh, with him in, in trying out new glazes and, and combinations. Again, what he's doing here is, is trying to make a, um, uh, a yin yang kind of complementary opposites between the rough surface and the preciousness of what we consider gold to be, the, the lunar surface, the rough, dark sexual surface against the fineness of, of a refined gold and, and putting that on an equally refined uh, uh, form. And that's, that's a real challenge. And I think when you're whenever you're starting some new exploration like that that's where the excitement that propels you forward comes from is from the the unanswered questions as you try to figure out what that balance will be um it reminds me of uh we uh, we uh Hideaki and i have not talked about this but the notion of wabi-sabi of the beauty and imperfection and uh, when you look at that, at the base glaze, the cratered graze, um, glaze, you would, you know, you wouldn't consider that a refined uh, surface for a form like this. But then the more you look at it, the more you examine it, and the closer you to get to it, you begin to appreciate the textural element, both visually and tactically, uh, as the closer you get to it. And and you find beauty in that uh, that kind of uh, uh, jarring um, original uh, you know initial sensation when you when you look at it. So I think um, I I love this piece for the contrasts involved and the complexity of that contrast. And I'd love to hear more from Hideaki where he sees this. Uh, uh, going both conceptually as well as in its physical form. We'll let him do that in a little bit. I just want to share with you a quote that I came across from Thomas. Only those who risk going too far can possibly learn how far one can go. And mm. the notion and the first show of he days that we did, when Thomas saw his work, Thomas asked to write the introductory essay to your work. Um, and the sense of both, I think, um, real respect for what you had already achieved and also the desire to encourage you in your work to continue your journey 
uh, and which makes it singular. One of the glories of the gallery and the artists that we have worked with, almost to a person, are on their own journey. And the work that they have created, again, shares with everyone around them, both their facility, but also their soul. Their spirit comes through in the work. Whether they articulate it in words, it's almost irrelevant because it comes through for me in the work that they have created. And certainly your work has done that, Hide, over the 20, 25 years I've lost count, mm -hmm. which is a good idea at my age to have lost count. <laughs> um, but the joy of watching you grow and discover, and to your credit, you have also um, built, because of who you are, an enormously loyal following for the work. Um, one, you've worked at it by going to the various shows, but more than that, people, the public is discerning at this point. It's no longer, what do you buy? And I'm going to buy the same thing. People are attracted to authentic, great works of art. And that's part of education in this country when people have benefited from it. But it's also part of what I think the goal of the gallery is, is to enable that talent ability and work to appear and certainly in your case it has appeared quite beautifully and people have responded to it in a very uh, positive and generous way throughout COVID and beyond COVID uh, they still are attracted to the work but I think they're attracted to your personality and I'm not talking about whether you sing or dance and how good you are at a cocktail party they're talking about your artistic personality that they are drawn to in quite a meaningful and beautiful way so in spite of the fact that you don't have a Jewish mother, I'm sure she'd be proud of you. <laughs> Rose, if we, did you find the octagonal piece? Let's look at that. So this was not part of the present exhibition, but I asked Rose if she could locate it so that we can talk a bit about this, um, I think, tour de force in so many ways. Mm -hmm. um, and Hida, I really want you to speak about it because you did one other piece that was sold to a collector of ECOTs, a sort of Central Asian, beautiful uh, materials, many of which are in the Museum of Fine Arts, others are at the Sackler in DC. And this has the feeling of a very beautiful and unique wow. ECOT, but at the same time, it has a sculptural presence that's quite amazing. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind talking about it, even though it's out of show, so to speak. Sure, uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, Asian, like, like uh, eight num number eight. Eight means uh, well, Japanese about eight is more like a uh, uh, when you write kanji, you know, Chinese characters. It's, uh, bottom is wider and the top is uh, smaller. That means building and anything that kind of structure very stable. So that's why I think eight number eight is very lucky number. So <laughs> I made the octagon shape jar this time. Uh, same way I used the blue hair fur and uh, blue uh, brown, brown line. The same, I already explained to you about the uh, glaze. So um, quite, I, I, quite you know, interesting that number. So I, I was I wasn't thinking about the, the you know those lucky one lucky number, but they uh, ended up eight like octagon shape. So um, same way I use the uh, bottom I throw and the middle section. I think I use this one uh, slab, and uh, then uh, top portion I throw again. But it's pouring from you know the square shape to a round top, it's always warp. So I was, I remember this is a, a kind of a, a, a first or well, second piece, I think. So, so many mistakes, so many um, uh, fail, fail, you know, fails, so many uh, cracks everywhere. So I, I throw many, many pieces, but this piece just came out, I remember very, very well. Uh, so Grace, came out very nicely. I, I like the glaze, especially the blue portion. It's very, very nice blue. And the same thing, a wavy and wavy uh, glaze design. Um, movement is good and the balance is, uh, I like balance too. And uh, same way I like a lidded jar. So I made a lid 
boy. So I um, hope people. Would you like to, uh, since this wasn't part of the program, but I just think it's such an extraordinary piece to just respond to it? Me, yes, yep. I would. I, I love this piece. Um, and for two reasons, one is the solidity of the form that has reference to the, the building that Hideaka mentioned. Um, and it's contrasted yet again by its complementary opposite. And that's the fluidity of the, of the, of the glaze and the way it's uh, with, with the action of the kiln is, is sort of bleeding down. So you've got that sense of movement in presented on a very formal structure that really sort of reminds me of, uh, you know, looking at a staff of music, which is very formal in its construction, but the sound that comes out of it is so fluid and, and beautiful. In a way, this is sort of a, a visual representation of, of, of what you find in that, in that particular language as well. And I like the fact that Hideaki's also chosen not to have it be solidly on the ground, but to have a sort of, it, it almost looks like it's levitating in a way, it's, it's floating in space. So it makes this heavy form uh, immediately feel lighter by the fact that you have this sort of hidden uh, understructure to the formal uh, octagon shape. So uh, again, very brilliant. There is also the sense of each of the panels being rectangles played off against the circles at the top. And then with the firing itself, the glaze burns off and you get some of the porcelain showing through to define those shapes in such a beautiful way. So there's the sort of straight lines of the rectangle, the circular lines at the top, and then again, the very gracious lid to bring our eye down to the piece and at the same time, lifting us up in a very beautiful way. And then as you pointed out, the levitation that's added to it. And one of the things that I didn't realize until yesterday when we did the webinar with Enrico is that the last time we had a show of Enrico Pinardi's, it was together with Hide. Um, and there is in a number of Enrico's pieces, levitating bowls. So I'm sure that it was not an act of genius on my part to put them together, but it's <laughs> nice to have the levitation of both of their works together. Mm. Can we look at the next piece, Rose, please? Lovely. A very simple form, um, again, carrying forward the blaze that Hide likes a lot. Um, so just a couple of thoughts from both of you, Hide. Yeah, uh, that's very interesting. When I was studying, uh, I was apprentice, uh, you know, uh, my teacher, uh, had to make money, of course, you know, so I did production at that time already. I, I made uh, many, many uh, cups, mugs, uh, plates, those things. Then same time, we, we made uh, gift uh, items too. So one of the gift items, this is the, the you know, lots of bells, you know. Uh, so it, the bell shape, it's always beauty to me because part of the, my brain is still remember the bell we made, you know, every day for gift, gift shop. So I liked it, the shape very much so because of it, because the, uh, you know, those that uh, gift, gift items. But still I remember the, the beauty of uh, the shape. So uh, that's why I made that uh, bell shape this time and the uh, same way I, I uh, apply two glazes for this piece. So this is that uh, 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 why I end up this shape. Uh, that's uh, my explanation for it. And Franz, just um, briefly your response to it. Yeah, my, my response to it is the, it has, um, it, it reminds me of a number of different things. One, whirling dervishes, you know, the spinning yeah. of the, uh, and the banding around the piece uh, kind of suggests that that is in movement spinning, even though it's a very solid form that has a really strong connection to the to the table. But it has the feeling of of movement in the, and it also reminds me of Victorian women's dresses with the big <laughs> you know, uh, and and just uh, the kind of showcase of that to uh, to bring your attention to the the simple form itself. It's a, it's a wonderful, there's a lot of 
activity on this small piece. And when you see that, you can also imagine it working as successfully as a larger piece as well. Which is usually an indication both of a good small piece and a potentially good large piece. Exactly. Just need a larger kiln. Next piece, please. <laughs> And I think, Hide, this is an opportunity for yeah. you to, to remember yeah. the, the, the days of yore when you first began working with the Blue Harris for Glaze. Yeah, this is the uh, great ex example of the uh, Blue Harris for. Uh, just the blue area just runs very nicely. Uh, yeah, I remember this piece always. Uh, it's just a great, uh, it's just a, came out, just name Blue Hairs for just right. This is it. This is it, which is rare. I mean, I've-, I've, I've Yeah, it's very rare, yes. One of the things I've learned after these years of working with Thomas was that he may have done 25,000 pieces, but he broke 23,000 of them because <laughs> there were very few that were exactly right. Meaning not only physically and visually right, but emotionally right. Mm. This piece feels like in a way, and I don't mean it in a lighthearted way, perfection. The scale of the piece, the way the glaze has fallen on the piece, the luminescence that the Harrisburg gives in this piece. And you've used it over and over again, so many times beautifully, but it's just like, bing, and it's perfect. And I just yeah. love that sense of the piece the, itself. There's a, so many color on it, uh, like a blue, blue, purple, even gold in it, uh, yeah. middle section. And the blue and the purple is just a uh, grace, just beautiful. Wonderful, wonderful piece. We have a couple of more actually, or just actually one more, but it would be very nice to look at them in two different ways. Yeah. And you can speak of this one. This is, I think, just yeah. quite beautiful. It's an extension of the piece before in many ways, but mm -hmm. it, it also, um, has your pagoda top, um, yeah. a variety of other things, and it's nicely shown with and without the top. Yeah. So the um, uh, I made a quite a lot of peacock glaze, but uh, the uh, this is interesting too. The uh, you know I always like to uh, make new glazes, and the same way blue hair spot itself doesn't do anything to me. You know once you make many pieces, then I like to have same thing, some, some kind of design on it. So then um, I tasted, this one's 200 pieces uh, for uh, second glaze. So second glaze makes those peacock effect there on, you know, you can see design on it. So uh, once I apply and came out the first piece, I was sh just shocked how the second glaze make, make this kind of the uh, peak of effect. So um, I like the kind of black background uh, behind the peacock, like a bottom, you can see the, uh, uh, you can see more peacock effect on it. So uh, once a uh, glaze getting thinner, uh, Gray is kind of fading, so uh, but still, still good, I, I can say. So uh, that's all. Always, like I said, always testing new ways. Uh, and, uh, that's the piece, and uh, I, you know, I developed on the two name and peacock. So I hope you can see peacock effect on it. We can see peacock. <laughs> Franz, your turn at the peacock. Sure. Uh, I, the fullness of the form and the upliftingness of the form uh, is complemented really well with the delicacy and the pretty specific, I would say, and when you see it in person, reference to peacock feather. I mean, it is remarkable how close it comes to that. And so the fullness and power of that uplifting form combined with that delicacy is a, again, a beautiful yin yang uh, complementary opposite. And we have what's going on here. And I didn't mention, I didn't get to mention in the last piece too, where the, the glaze on the broad shoulders of the piece uh, are, are the lightest um, in value. And when the piece comes in at the bottom and in the last piece where it came in at the neck, 
um, it, it's darker in tone. So it creates a kind of Venturi effect where uh, the, the darkness of the collar in the last piece and towards the base in this one brings that form in visually as well as physically. And then the lighter tones at the broadest part in both pieces make that piece even more full and expansive. And that's what I love about both these last two uh, pieces you showed. That's really I think you are, you, are, you are right. And uh, I don't like simple round shape. You know, I always make shorter. So mm -hmm. I, I like the shape like this than totally round. So thank you. That's a really nice comment, Franz, and in a way helps us, I think, come to close to an end. There are some other things I want to say, but to thank both of you for your generosity and for your help. And Franz, especially for your ability to articulate the beauty of the pieces themselves in a way that make them even more accessible to the maker. Thank um, you. It's really, really quite a, an art in and of itself and a quite, quite glorious to do that. And again, Hide, just to say to you that um, one more quote, when you don't know something can't be done, it makes it possible to do it. Okay. And I think that that's yes. a, a wonderful way to think about your journey, mm -hmm. meaning that there is your desire and need to continue to grow and to evolve to create a new, um, and the fact that somebody says you can't be done doesn't mean anything mm -hmm. because there is an inner need. And that's something that um, I admire in so many of the artists that we have worked with over the years, that the easiest way out is to repeat themselves. Right. Because the public is comfortable with what they have done. And in terms of economics, they also mm -hmm. expect that and are happy to buy it. But the willingness to need to continue to grow, to evolve, to express who you are through your work, and hence to stay alive ultimately, and I'm talking not about uh, fiscally, but about emotionally, is what art can do at its best. And I think in truth that what your art has done, it really has provided you, but others with an opportunity to realize that life is about change and growth, but neither of which are intentional but rather grow authentically out of the experience of who you are and the privilege of being able to share your work uh, over these more than two decades. So then <clears throat> it's not quite three decades um, to say to everyone, what a joy it is to share these works of ever risking um, of Hide's work with you. And just thank you for joining us today. And hope this made your day considerably more wonderful. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you.